Hi, Alex. Hi, Bob. How are you doing? Good. How are you? You must be doing pretty well with the Spurs off to a good start. I know you're a Spurs guy. I'm kind of a Spurs guy. We should explain for our non-basketball literate viewers that we're, we're not talking about, you know, horseback riding here. We're talking about the San Antonio Spurs. I went to high school in San Antonio. Uh, and, uh, I am a Spurs fan and, and you're a Spurs fan. I was going to talk about that anyway. Let me introduce this, but I want to get to the Spurs because, uh, one thing we're going to talk about in general, this being Meaning of Life TV, is the connection between basketball, which you are something, uh, of an expert on, uh, and meaning, the various ways it can bring meaning to a person's life. I, and, and in, in particular the way it's brought meaning to, I think, your life, as we will explore, but also the way it's the kind of meaning it has in connection to Barack Obama's life, which brings us, by the way, to your, uh, your new book, The Audacity of Hoop, which I am bringing to people's attention just in time for the gift-buying season. It actually, it actually is, a great, it is a great gift book. Great pictures. It's a, it's a great... It, it's a, a coffee table book, not in a bad sense of the word, not in the sense that you just put it on the coffee table and don't read it, but in the sense that it uh, does everything a coffee table book should do, which is be fun to browse and have uh, great pictures um, and be something you can actually absorb in bite-sized chunks if you want. You know, there, there are these little set pieces, um, but also is an actually good book. Uh, and we will be talking about the audacity of hoop, Alex Wolf. Um, but let me introduce you a little bit. You are Alex Wolf. The byline, the famous byline to, to readers of Sports Illustrated is Alexander Wolf. Uh, you have written about various things, but in particular about basketball, which I, I think is your first love among sports. You're also the author of Raw Recruits, uh, co-author of that, a, a bestseller about um, how uh, money in various ways uh, corrupts uh, so-called amateur athletics, um, beginning sometimes when, when athletes are very, very young. I also wrote the, the game, uh, uh, the, the book, Big Game, Small World, about basketball and the globalization of basketball which is not unrelated to the Spurs uh, because they are a kind of a global team. Um, and, and you wrote a book that I actually read in manuscript because I knew you then, and you wrote this longer ago than either of us cares to remember, as they say, the In Your Face Playground. Uh, no, the In Your Face, it's the In Your Face basketball book, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why am I tempted basketball. to call it the In Your Face Guide to Playground Basketball? That was the original title, believe it or not. Was it? Yeah, we kicked it around, and wisely, the publisher decided shorter was better. Okay, okay. Um, so anyway, you're here, which is great. Uh, and um, let's talk, before we get to you, your, your connection to basketball and how basketball gives your life meaning, um, let's talk about the book. Um, it's, uh, as I said, you know, filled with great pictures and so on. But uh, I had not it, – it kind of – the story of Obama and basketball starts on an almost mythic note. I, I had not – and I hadn't known about this, but I'm talking about like December of 1971, right? Do you want to tell the story about what seems to be, I guess, more or less the beginning of his, his contact with the game of basketball? Yeah, it's the last time he ever sees his dad. And one, his of, dad, and one of the first times, right? I mean, his his father had left them when he was a year old or something. Yeah, I mean, he, it's certainly the last time he remembers seeing his dad. His dad's shortly thereafter killed in a car accident back in Kenya. But yeah, he's abandoned the family a number of years prior to that, but makes us visit back to Hawaii for Christmas, where Barack's mother is still living with her mom and dad. And and. In defiance of everything I know about sports in Africa, particularly in Kenya, he gives him the gift of a basketball. Completely counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. You'd think it would be a soccer ball or something cricket related. But in any case, it's a basketball. And it so happens that at around the same time, the University of Hawaii is having this great run of success with the Rainbows, the local basketball team. And... Barack's grandfather, that is his mother's dad, gets these rare tickets and takes him to a game and sometime January or February shortly thereafter. And the combination of this ball and these young black men, young Barry Obama doesn't see many African-Americans in Hawaii. There are very few there other than a handful attached to the military at the time. 
So he starts to slot himself into this world, being a young black man, and sees basketball as kind of a part of it. So through his adolescence, he's working out these, or beginning to work out these issues of racial identity mm -hmm. with. Let me show people the picture of uh, December 1971, him and his father. It's really, uh, it seems to be at an airport. Um, it's, uh, you can see the holiday uh, uh, lights in the, in the background. It's really kind of sweet, especially when you realize that this is a rare instance of contact with his father. He seems so delighted um, to be with him. And as you say, I mean, so, so that alone is, is, is bound to give the, the gift of the basketball significance. But as you say, there's also the question of kind of black identity. I mean, here's uh, a kid who is identified as black, but you know, doesn't very often see a parent who's actually black. His, his, his mother's white, his grandparents are white, um, and they're playing, a, I guess, a big role in rearing him, right? Um, and, yeah. and so, and so I, I, you know, I, I guess you, you, by your own admission, this, this is a little bit, con all of this is a little bit conjectural, but it's kind of, it makes sense to me. Well, and he's actually, I think we can strip away some of the conjecture because in Obama's own memoir, Dreams from My Father, he writes pretty movingly about the role the game played and even even kind of identifies basketball as something like a potential part of a misspent youth, that he was playing a little bit into stereotypes of what a young black man ought to be. And you can see this as the beginning of a somewhat ambivalent relationship with the game as he makes his way through life. So he, he goes off and he plays ball in, in these Honolulu playgrounds he gets a scholarship to the, the very Tony Punaho school, uh, tries out for the team, but doesn't get a whole lot of playing time as a high schooler because he's self-taught and the coach is young and kind of rigid. And here's this guy that the coach acknowledges loves the game. I mean, he'll go from high school team practice down to the courts at the school and play pickup right after practice. Mm -hmm. But he couldn't really find a place for him on the team. And it's a team that's going to win a state title. There's the coach in the foreground there. Yeah, the guy so, in the so there's a coach. Here for the people who are watching this on video, not, not by podcast. And, and that's Barack, right? In the back row on the far right, right. right. And Chris McLaughlin, the coach, it's still a young guy. You can see starting out his coaching career. And, of course, you're a high school coach and you have a future president on your team and you didn't play him. you got to answer years later to why you didn't, didn't see his potential. <laughs> and he said – you know, if you'd come to me when I was later in my career, I probably would have been more secure and not just played five or six guys and only go to the bench when we had a huge lead. But to be fair to him, this was a team that had two future NFL players on it, and Obama probably could have started for any other team in the state, but not this one. Yeah, they, they won the state, uh, the state high school championship generally or in a certain division or? Generally. I mean, it was the biggest, it was the open or biggest division. Yeah, that, that was a funny part of the book where you can just see this poor coach has been, I mean, what seems to have happened is that this player of his grows up to be a senator and then president, and he's going, oh man, I shouldn't have dissed this guy. You know, this is like, you want to you wanna be on the, on, the, on the right side of the president of the United States. And it had been an issue because Obama had complained about not getting playing time in, in high school, right? He had. And I, I think part of his passion for playing pickup, which abides right on through college and while he's a young adult in New York, Chicago, Harvard Law School, I think part of that is just that whole, that, that kind of unrequited relationship with the game. Mm -hmm. And he wants to kind of backfill it. And it took a while, but he's since acknowledged, you know, if I'd had a dad who'd taken me to the park and taught me how to use the offhand, maybe I would have deserved a little more playing time. In retrospect, I can't really fault the coach, mm -hmm. but at the time, he thought the coach had something against him. Mm -hmm. And he and he made and he made it an issue at the time. The uh, it's I, I I can relate, you know. I I like him. I made varsity in high school and didn't see a lot of playing time. Uh, my claim to fame, in fact, is that uh, as I think I've told you, my uh, we played our games uh, at the place where the San Antonio Spurs practiced during the summer. Blossom Athletic Center in San Antonio, Texas, where at that time they were so... Uh, I, share, I shared the hardwoods with uh, George Gervin, the Iceman, in a certain sense. We were never there at the same time, but <laughs> there's a kind of bond that I think we both feel. Uh, the, the, um, so, uh, it, you know, it's an interesting situation he was, he was in, though, because my team did not win the state championship. Uh, where uh, I, I would think that his being on the team must have been a source of, of esteem. I mean, when a team is that much of a powerhouse, everyone associated with the team 
is like a little bit of a a little got to be a little bit of a star. I mean, you're happy you're on the team. Yeah, and if, you know the one book that I really devoured as I was working on mine, the biography, my go-to biography was David Marinus's book, where he really focuses in. It's called Barack Obama: The Story. I know you have great show notes for these uh, these video podcasts. Um, highly recommend it. And he he gets in for three or four really detailed pages into what it was like. And he, yeah, Obama, by the time he's a senior and they're having that great season, he's along for the ride. And he makes some really good friends. I mean, when he goes back to Hawaii over the holidays, even as president, he's meeting up with a handful of guys who are on that team. Uh-huh. So if nothing else, he's he, he's kind of laid down a foundation of friendship that he'll then take on from from Hawaii, even if his whole basketball experience fell a little short. Yeah. And there's something about being on a team uh, that that that, uh, that that itself forms bonds, unlike um, unlike other things. The the um, so he goes through uh, this becomes a, I guess when he's uh, become getting into politics, um, this becomes a little bit of an it starts to become an asset when he's uh, I don't know if he's running for the state senator or is a state senator, but here's here's a good shot of when he's playing hoops with an apparently undersized ball with. Uh, Chicago uh, kids. He kind of looks like a player there. You know, he kind of looks <laughs> looks like he knows what he's doing there. And in some of these pictures, he does, um, although I've seen video, and I think you're right, He's do- he looks like a kind of an uncoached player, right? He doesn't yeah, he have only, your cla- your classic jump shot form or anything like that. Yeah, he's, he's and he's only a left-hander. I mean, he, he fakes right, and you play with him once or twice, you know not to bite on that fake, and then he'll go left. And uh, one of my favorite pictures in the book, as long as we're doing show and tell here, Bob, Mm. um, it's a picture that I think circles back to that business about the dad and the ball. It's when he, um, you know, he said that if his dad had taken him to the park, he'd been around to do that. Maybe he would have developed that at offhand. Well, there's this great shot of him here. You know, they don't generally, the White House photo office doesn't generally release these photos of the girls because they want to preserve their privacy. Let me see if I can get this right. But this shot right here is of, um, it's not showing up real well, but that's Sasha and Malia. If you move it to your right, it'll be slightly more, uh, well, uh, okay. Oh yeah. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. And what I love about this picture, aside from that kind of John, John and Caroline Kennedy under the desk (laughs) in life magazine vibe to it. Um, what I love about it is he's working on his offhand, Bob. He's he's doing what a father's supposed working to do. Working on his right hand, yeah. He's, he's, he's on his yeah. right hand. So his dad didn't do the do the uh, the hard work of raising him, but he's doing hard work with his girls. So, um, so yeah, there, there's a full circle of quality, I think, to the to his relationship with the game, and and even you know people are asking me, okay, he leaves office. Is basketball going to continue to be part of his life? And I think this whole My Brother's Keeper initiative that he's worked on through the White House and is now going to be transitioned to the My Brother's Keeper Alliance for his post-presidency, I think he has a real credibility when he'll talk to at-risk urban young men, who so many of whom are intrigued by basketball, sometimes seduced by basketball. And he can say with real credibility, look, this game sucked me in. Mm-hmm. And there were a couple of inflection points in my life where I could have you know, turned it into misspent youth. But I made these other decisions and the game abided. I still have this relationship with the game. It's a way for friendship. It's a way for Mm -hmm. good health. It's a way actually for me to kind of find a way into the culture and connect with, with voters on the campaign trail and, and foreign leaders for that matter. Now, it also helps him get married, right? There's this, uh, this anecdote about Craig right now. I remember uh, watching, you know, you and I knew each other at, uh, at, Princeton. And I remember after I graduated, coming back to a game or two, I guess, and, and noting what a great player Craig Robinson uh, was, who's, of course, Michelle Obama's um, brother. And uh, tell a story about uh, Obama and when he was courting Michelle, playing with Craig. So Michelle had been dating Barack for about a year. And she'd grown up hearing her brother and her dad constantly say, oh, you can always tell a guy's character from how they comport themselves on the court. Mm-hmm. So she said, all right, you know, take this guy out playing on a Saturday morning with your buddies and let me know what you think. 
um, she was kind of at that fish or cut bait moment with him. And apparently to hear Craig Robinson tell the story, he shot when he should have shot and he passed when he should pass. And he didn't try too hard to suck up to his potential future brother-in-law by always passing him the ball. Um, so he came back and said, your boy's straight. And the rest <laughs> is sort of history. Uh, that's funny. Um, the uh, so so he becomes president. I'm trying to find the shot where he's playing. Uh, we're during a, uh, a a campaign sweep through North Carolina. He he finds himself. Uh, he's playing against the uh, the college player of the year. Uh, I can't find the picture, but it, it, it's one of these shots that I I fear this is going to end badly. Um, <laughs> the, guy, <laughs> the guy's kind of towering over him, and and I'm not even sure the guy is giving it 100 percent. His feet are on the ground, but it still looks like he may swat whatever Obama is going to throw up there. Um, well, well beyond the bounds of the court, uh, I may find it. The um, but so he he becomes president, and and he what you know a, a number of presidents have had their signature uh, athletic installments. I think Nixon built a bowling alley and and so on. But what does Obama? He actually has a, a tennis court converted to a to a basketball court, or what? Yeah, there was initially talk about ripping out the bowling alley and putting in an indoor court, but I think the American Bowling Alliance raised holy hell, and that never happened. So well, we just retrofitted. You know how special interests are in Washington. Yeah. They uh, retrofitted the, the tennis court on the South Lawn, and for a good chunk of his first term, he was out there a lot, um, taking the edge off by playing horse with Reggie Love, his personal aide. Who had played for um, Duke, right? who was, yeah, a co-captain at Duke, was on a national championship team there and uh, left after the first term. And then he had this uh, misadventure playing a pretty serious game with Arne Duncan and a few others uh, the Friday after Thanksgiving in 2010 where he takes an elbow and loses um, – he didn't lose any teeth, but he needed 12 stitches. And from that point on, he moves over to golf much more than basketball. Uh-huh which kind of, it, it marks the end of at least a part of his relationship with basketball in office. So, yeah, so that's that's kind of his relationship with, with the South Lawn Court. I mean, he does go out there to shoot. Occasionally, will if a team comes in for a Rose Garden ceremony after winning a title, he might grab a few of the players and go play horse with them down at the, mm-hmm. down at the court. But his serious playing is curtailed pretty, pretty much after that episode. Yeah. The uh, so you mentioned Arnie Duncan, so Secretary of Education. He had played basketball at Harvard. Do you think the, his, Obama's love for basketball could have influenced some of his hiring decisions? I mean, it wouldn't shock me at all if if there was one thing he liked about Reggie Love. Of course, you might say that's not the most as consequential a position as Secretary of Education. I mean, Reggie Love is, his, I think, his so-called body man. Is that what they called him? A, a guy who a guy who's just with you all the time. You need your cell phone. He hands it to you. You know, whatever. Um, but. Uh, have you thought about that? I mean, uh, do you think Obama just just you grow in his esteem if you if you were a college basketball star? And I think Arnie Duncan, you know, although Harvard isn't isn't Duke in basketball, uh, Arnie Duncan was a was was he was a starter there, right? He was good. Oh, he was yeah. He was a co captain at Harvard, played four years professionally in Australia, and most impressive to me was even as he's chief of the Chicago Public Schools and then joins the, the cabinet. He's winning national three-on-three competitions uh, right up to age 50 or so. Yeah. So I think what happened with Duncan is Obama and Duncan are in the same social and basketball circles in Chicago. So he really gets to know him. And education is that thing where I think Obama wants that comfort level. Um, it's, it's striking to me how much Duncan was a kind of flat catcher for him. It seemed like the teacher you. Teachers unions all wanted to whack him like a pinata, but they didn't want to go after Obama, even though these are Obama's policies being represented by by Duncan. But anyway, um, yeah, I think that was definitely a case of of the guy's basketball experience and, and that, that social world in Hyde Park in Chicago that included Duncan and, and guys like Marty Nesbitt and Eric Whitaker, who played Division Three ball, John Rogers, who was at Princeton when we were there. Um, was also part of that world. Mm-hmm. Um, those people he was very close to, and in the case of Duncan, he had real credentials to be a secretary of education. Yeah, yeah. Um, the uh, and then uh, near the end, you, you, you know, you 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 do get into the golf a little bit, 
Uh, it's obviously kind of a, a bittersweet moment at best from your point of view. You are, you are, as I recall, no no fan of golf and its uh, kind of socio political connotations. I, I think I've tried to convince you that there actually is a is a, a working class version of golf. You can there are municipal courses all over America where you can go and meet a true and play and meet a true uh, diversity of people, ethnically, socioeconomically, and so on. It's actually true. But, um, but yeah, I know when you think of golf, you think country club and you don't approve. So, so, and, and I sense in the several pages you spend on Obama and golf, you, you just, we just didn't, I didn't feel the author's glow of enthusiasm there. (laughs) Well, okay. Um, you've outed me, (laughs) but it, I, I do have a sympathy for his shift over to golf. I get it. Here's a, a guy who grew up in Hawaii who was outdoors all the time. And as he said, it's his only chance really to get outdoors. And the Secret Service agents, though they're they're there, they're kind of in the woods. Um, and, and to his credit, he wasn't exclusive in his attitude toward golf. He would he would play with Alonzo Mourning and Ray Allen and – and lower level White House aides. In fact, he took a lot of criticism for not playing with the Vernon Jordans and, you know, the right. Machers. For the not, people- not networking, which is what you're supposed to do with golf. Exactly. Exactly. And, and, and- well, and to be fair, and I think this part of the criticism may, may have some, some merit that, uh, you know, members of Congress, I mean, uh, Eisenhower used to, used to play golf with the Speaker of the House, and there's something to be said for the political wisdom of, especially in this day of kind of, you know, uh, ideological division, maybe of, of using golf to do some bonding with uh, with with the Bainers of the world, but um, but you're right. That that's the criticism, and, and ironic. It is ironic that he's being criticized for not being country clubbish enough about golf, in a way. Yeah, and then of course there are people who are going to criticize him for playing golf at all when he should be solving the the Middle East or whatever it is, and. The fact is, I think 330 or so, the last time I checked, rounds of golf he's played in two terms, whereas Eisenhower was over 800. So let's put this in some kind of perspective. Yeah, so Eisenhower was playing a couple of times a week, I guess, at least. Um, yeah, and, and Obama's less than that. The, uh, so uh, let's talk a little about, I mean, we've kind of alluded to the bonding effect of uh, – Playing basketball with people. I mean, I guess that's kind of suggested by your your analysis of the Arnie Duncan relationship. And there is something. I mean, in here you can start speaking from personal experience. And we should say, I mean, you played. Uh, you took a year off from college to go play basketball in Switzerland. And what what would you call that kind of semi pro or what? What's the what's the categorization of that league you were in? No, it was the third division. I mean, it was, it was semi, semi, semi pro. I mean, it was <laughs> underdeveloped. It was a little bit like junior varsity high school basketball, I'd say, on, on some with, with bigger, more mature athletes. But just the the feel for the game. It was a place I could comfortably fit in as a washed up high school player who was a little bit restless about being on campus, uh-huh. um, live in another culture, and and learn a little German and. Um, but yeah, my own relationship to the game, it, it's funny. I grew up in Princeton during the 60s, and my mom was a classically trained pianist, and my dad was a, a German refugee, and neither of them had any interest in sports. And to be in Princeton during the 60s was to fall under the spell of Bill Bradley or the legend of Bill Bradley. I wasn't quite old enough to actually sit in Dylan Jim to watch him play, but I was well aware of what was going on. And firstborn, only boy felt this subtle pressure to follow in my parents' footsteps. But, of course, I wanted to make my own mark. And basketball seemed to be this sanctioned way to do it because of Bradley. Hmm. And so that was that was initially what got me hooked. And then there was this kind of window onto the African-American experience. Um, so if we're talking about meaning of life and basketball, it was it was kind of a set of guideposts in a way to kind of get me out of my own childhood and, and and show me a little bit of a wider world out there. Mm-hmm. So I could relate on some level, I could relate to Obama's own grappling with basketball as he's trying to sort something out. And certainly I'm not pretending that the stakes of my own mm-hmm. little junior varsity grappling were anywhere near as high as Obama's, but that was my journey too. Mm-hmm. 
Did you play much pickup basketball in Princeton? I did. I did. In fact, I once played with Craig Robinson when I was a, a senior and he was a freshman. I remember memorably one spring day out behind Dylan Jim on the outdoor courts there, being on his team and holding court for a while. It's holding a nice court thing to mean, mean we should say to people that in, in pickup basketball, if you're on the winning team, you get to stay and play the game, the next game, and then the, another group of challengers shows up, assuming there's enough to field three teams, enough people to field three teams. So holding court means you kept on winning. And, and uh, I, I was going to ask, because at that point, Princeton had actually a larger black population than it has now. now they, the, the black population has been largely uh, displaced by a Latino population, um, mainly from, largely from Guatemala. But... Um, so, so it was, it, it was, uh, it, it was a diverse uh, pickup milieu, ethnically diverse pickup milieu in which you played. I gather, which I've always thought was one of the great things. I mean, growing up myself uh, w- about basketball was that you would go to various courts and you'd have various ethnic and socioeconomic compositions, but it was definitely a way to kind of see the world, so to speak. Yeah, and I think Obama discovered that too. I mean, he would, when he was a lecturer at University of Chicago Law School, he would play in the field house there. In fact, Arnie Duncan's mom would be in those games and she was notoriously physical. Um, and Obama to this day will take up old grievances with Arnie about his mother and her <laughs> elbows. Um, but yeah, you get the full range of, of types and, and even the, the kind of interpersonal uh, relationships and how you have to smooth over differences. I mean, there is a kind of political backroom quality that rises to the surface. Yeah, it's an interesting uh, it, playing in an unrefereed basketball game, which pickup basketball is. I just this just occurred to me. It has this interesting dynamic where you call your own fouls. You just say, "I was fouled." You know, and you might think, well, that's a crazy system. You know, you, you, this is going to dissolve in chaos as everyone has always claimed, claimed their foul. But there's an informal feedback system for, like, discouraging, you know, the indiscriminate claim that you were fouled, right? And, and, and it more or less holds. You know, people just start giving a guy shit if he's always saying he was fouled. Right. And I think there's also the, a prevailing machismo that right. helps enforce that because nobody wants to be a wuss. Right. And you, you really, in fact, one of my other favorite pictures in this book is uh, I only could find one picture of Obama wearing shorts when he's playing basketball. He's always wearing sweatpants. And Rick Tellender in Chicago and I have this theory that it's because he's really self-conscious about his skinny legs. And he, he writes in his memoir about how playing with those African-American men in Hawaii, they taught him lessons about not showing your vulnerabilities and so forth. Mm. And I'll never forget, remember when Clinton was on the campaign trail and he was asked that question, boxers versus briefs? Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and being Clinton, he couldn't answer the question fast enough. Well, when Obama was asked that question, he had the perfect reply. And in that reply, you could tell he's a ball player. If you've never seen him play basketball, he answered that question. I don't answer those humiliating questions, but whatever it is, I look good in them. <laughs> and, and that to me is... That's the attitude. That's the swagger that you sort of have to have on the playground. And we've seen, to a large extent, we've seen Obama use that. I think he's gotten in trouble sometimes politically with that attitude, being a little bit too cocky and being a front runner who lets up a little bit. But but that is what we see enforced on the playground, mm-hmm. that, that kind of ability to show your armor. Mm-hmm. One more point about the ethnic diversity of a lot of pickup basketball, at least, or at least some pickup basketball. Um, the, uh, you know, you talked about the, we, we, we talked about the fact that there's a certain kind of, um, negotiated order between teams, uh, in a, in an unrefereed game, but, you know, the relationship among the teammates, uh, has its own dynamic and there's, there's kind of nothing like the, feeling of being on a winning team with someone i mean first of all just being on a team with someone there's there's nothing like that feeling if it's a real you know contested struggle and, and you're serious about it which which can you can get pretty serious in playground basketball and um and then it's even better to be on the winning team of a, of a close game and and when uh the your team has a diverse character that's just a great feeling you know, you feel like you're, you're, the bond is transcending these cultural bounds. And, you know, uh, sociologists have done experiments. And, you know, the, 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 the formal way of putting this finding 
is that, uh, you know, they found that just putting people of different uh, races together is no guarantee of harmony. But giving them a common, what's called a superordinate goal, I think, or, or in other words, putting them in a non-zero-sum situation where they're in some sense in the same boat, they're working toward the same goal, especially if they're competing against another team. That does have a bonding effect. And, and that's why, you know, in professional sports, when a fight breaks out between two, two racially integrated teams, it's the color of the jerseys that's a unifying thing. It, it's, it's, so you see it there. But this is a long-winded way of saying that there's really a, 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 kind, of, um, a kind of beautiful thing that can happen in sports that I, that I think maybe people who haven't played in this kind of context might not appreciate. Well, and then in the playground setting, imagine that feeling you just described, Bob, and then it dissolves because you're, the teams are, are reassembled mm-hmm. because, the, you, 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 yeah, you hold court. But then if you lose, every, everybody is distributed back into the general pool and the teams are reassembled. So you're constantly getting that feeling or striving at least to get that feeling with a new set of teammates right. who might be in, in a different order or, or and, a different sort. But some of the some of the bond you developed with a, a former teammate endures in a certain sense. And, and maybe that's partly responsible for the, the kind of order we, we alluded to, is that, especially when it's a regular, you know, if it's a playground that the same kind of people frequent, you've been on the team with pretty much everyone. And you've had that feeling about them, and that, and that influences your relationship to them when they're on the other team. Yeah, no, no, there is. And I, I mean, one thing, if we're, if we're going to explore the meaning of life as it relates to basketball, I do think there is one, there's one thing about the sport that we can be alone with this game mm-hmm. in a driveway, in a gym, mm-hmm. kind of work in the same way, say, a musician maybe can work on exercises and mm-hmm. scales and all that. And then where we get the full expression of it is when we sit in, when we get a chance to, to see what we can do collectively. And I... When you look at Bill Bradley's writings, he's written four or five books. He he talks a lot about finding that kind of golden mean between the individual and the collective. Mm-hmm. If you read The Audacity of Hope by Obama, he talks about that too, that, that, that balance. And he's actually articulated it about basketball specifically. There was a, a great interview he gave with Bryant Gumbel during the campaign in 08 where he talks about there's no other time that that there's that collective goal merged with that individual. I mean, there are times, obviously, you need to hand the ball to your best player and let them go one-on-one. But still, the thing that we strive for is that thing you just articulated, which is that kind of magical team moment. Yeah, which actually became particularly associated with uh, Princeton basketball during the, the, especially during the Pete Carrill era, I guess. Uh, You know, the, the... uh, I mean, I guess John McPhee probably lauded Bill Bradley for this kind of thing. Come to think of it, in the sense of where you are, I'm not. I'm not sure, but 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 in any event, uh, you know, the Princeton style or whatever it was called was characterized by a lot of passing and uh, selflessness back during the, the the age when they really had a pretty consistently good team. No, it's true. And one of the the ironies in working on this book was to discover that this completely undomesticated player from Hawaii winds up in Chicago and falls in with Craig Robinson and John Rogers. And John Rogers has this investment firm in Chicago. He lends out an office to the transition team before the federal office building in Chicago was ready for him. So Obama's elected. The first phone calls he makes to world leaders are from a, a room named after Pete Carrill in John Rogers' investment firm. So here this guy who, who couldn't get playing time for his high school coach because he was too undisciplined is sitting in the Pete Carrill suite at Ariel Investments in Chicago. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you, um, you, ever since I've known you, you've had an interest in kind of the the uh, African American experience in America, ranging from pop culture, you know, things like Motown to the civil rights movement. <clears throat> I'm kind of curious uh, which came first. To what extent? Uh, maybe basketball drew you into this interest and to what extent this interest drew you into basketball and to what extent it's just a chicken and egg uh, question you can't answer. Basketball is the first thing I remember. I mean, I remember as a seven or eight year old in the driveway being vaguely aware of Bill Bradley. Jeff Petrie came along just after that. He was somebody I actually saw play. Um, And the other subtle message I got from my mother, she heard it from her pediatrician 
it was decades ahead of, of the current thinking, but avoid football. Football is good for the head. Yeah. Um, so again, being the, the oldest boy wanting to please my parents, basketball seemed to have that sanction. So I'm in it. And then um, we move when I'm 11 or 12 years old and to a, a more urban part of the world in Rochester, New York. And that's when race gets layered onto it more, but it was impossible in the late sixties and early seventies, not to be aware uh, of a culture that was becoming more, more integrated and the expressions of black culture were trickling down, gliding over whatever, whatever verb phrase you want to use. And for a kid, it, it was, you know, whether it was the music or the, the sports for a white suburban kid, it was enticing. Yeah. The, um, and you're still uh, playing. Last time I saw you, you were, for better or worse, you were still playing. I am still. I try to play once or twice a week, um, a, a noontime college game. Every college campus has it, and there's one near where I live. And, uh, you know, I've had to scale everything back. Is this full court things. or half court? Full court, where possible. That's commendable um, and arguably not wise, but because uh, you're, you're older than you look, uh, I should explain to people. But uh, <laughs> the... the uh, uh, but God bless you and, and Godspeed with it, with uh, full court basketball. Um, so you, you mentioned the San Antonio Spurs early on and, and in a way this is, uh, just revisits a theme we've already, uh, discussed in, but in a different context, we talk about the way, uh, basketball can kind of, um, assimilate diversity, so to speak. Um, but with the Spurs, you see it on an international scale, right? Talk a little about what the Spurs have done, aside from be, being one of the, the dynasties of, I guess, the past 15 years or so. Well, I, I think, in, in a way, I've spent a fair amount of time around them over the last year or two, working on pieces about Patty Mills, their Australian guard, and Becky Hammond, most recently, their assistant coach. And pa- Patty Mills is part, at least, Aborigine, right? He's actually totally Indigenous Australian, but... Wow part Aborigine and part Torres Strait Islander. So he actually, he's living, breathing Australian history. Um, but I have this theory about Greg Popovich. The you know, coach. He, the coach. He, he comes off as this um, prickly, uh, opaque guy who's always fencing with sideline reporters. And I think what it is is he he just knows or feels that there is meaning to this game that he coaches and he's offended that these inane questions are being thrown at him that don't seem to acknowledge the deep meaning mm-hmm. that there is. And the fact that they go out and assemble these polyglot collections of players seems to me almost as if Popovich is trying to prove a point. He's trying, trying to turn his team into this laboratory to prove to people that, yeah, we can have a woman on our bench and we can have seven or eight different countries re- represented. And almost because of that, we are going to be more effective on the court. Um, he has that stubborn streak that makes me wonder if he's, he's trying to prove a point. But I, I think this idea of meaning of life, um, with him particularly, if he ever writes a memoir, it's going to be a really interesting one. Um, I, I think there's a lot at play there. Yeah, he's, he's not naive. He knows he has to win uh, to keep his job. And there are all these exigencies of pro sports at a really high level and that he has to abide by, but it's, it's almost as if he has another point to prove. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think it's not crazy to think that the increasingly international character of this sport and, and some other sports, although interestingly, in a way, this is basketball has become more broadly international than other sports with baseball. You get, it's kind of within the Western hemisphere, it's international. You get, you know, a lot of from from Latin America. Certain Latin American countries generate a lot of baseball players, football players. Aside from, I mean, there was a time when a lot of field goal kickers were European soccer players. I think even that era may be over. But aside from that, you don't you don't get a lot. Is basketball the most international uh, of the major sports? Well, the major American sports, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think soccer sure. will always will always have that special that special status. And obviously soccer really is now getting traction in the States. Um, yeah. Baseball, it's a weird thing. It's almost like this patronizing um, 
Northern North American versus Latin and South American uh, thing going on that I, th I think takes a little bit of the internationalization away from it. Basketball right now, I think there are 130 players in the NBA this season with some sort of international pedigree. Wow. Uh, China that's, that's has out of more, like how many players? Less than a thousand, probably, right? Yeah, it's uh, what 12 or 13 on 20 some odd franchises. So that, that's a pretty impressive number. And there are more in China. There are more NBA fans than in the United States, straight up. It's obviously a function of their huge population, yeah. but that that says something. I mean that. And they're, and from, and they're from all over. I mean, they're from they're from Africa. They're from Europe. They're from South America. You know, even Yao Ming from uh, no longer no longer playing, but from China. Yeah, no, and and some some of these countries that have supplied. I mean, there's the guy who played third division ball in Switzerland couldn't help but notice that there's now a a Swiss in the NBA. So that it says a lot about the about globalization and the reach of American soft power, but it also says a lot about. I think rising incomes and so forth overseas. Africa, every little village now has satellite TV. Mm -hmm. So you'll find African kids mimicking NBA moves. Um, it, so it's. I would think this, this has on balance a good effect. I mean, soccer illustrates how, in some contexts, the game can have a bad respect with, with regard to nationalism. I mean, you know, European hooligans and so on. But, um, but I got to think on balance, this is a good thing. Uh, yeah, and, and basketball isn't organized nearly as much by tribe. Right. You know, it's the best players are, are assembling in the U.S. and the NBA sort of sorts them out. And yeah, you see a little bit if, if say you have Yugoslavia playing or Serbia playing Croatia or something in, in the Olympics, there's going to be an edge. But in basketball, but for the most part, the NBA sort of elevates everybody under this status as global celebrity. Mm hmm. Well, uh, thank you. The last thing I'm going to say about you is you've al always been um, an aficionado of the book as a, a physical object. I mean, your grandparents were kind of publishing, uh, publishing titans, right? I mean, they, they, they brought uh, the Pantheon. They created the Pantheon imprint, didn't they? Uh, which, which became this highbrow publishing thing. They brought it over from Europe. Is that right? Well, they actually founded it. They founded here, Pantheon. Yeah. Yeah. They, they were immigrants from Germany and uh, during the Second World War actually founded Pantheon in New York. And mm -hmm. um, yeah. So but, anyway, but it, it shows was... up. It is reflected in this. You clearly played a role in, um, in, in thinking this through as a, as a physical thing. It's, it's really an attractive book. All these great pictures. Uh, apparently the White House photographer opened up his archives to you. Um, and Pete Souza was, was wonderfully helpful and, yeah, the, most of the photos in the book are his. And while I didn't get a one-on-one -on -one with the president, I got all sorts of cooperation from uh, the man who's with him virtually 24-7. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, that's it's great. It really shows. It really is a great gift book, i got to say. Uh, if, uh, if you're an Obama lover and a basketball lover, it's the perfect book, or, or if the person you're giving the gift to fits that description. If you're an Obama hater, it probably makes a good like joke present, doesn't it? Well, and we even have a few pages about the game in GOP Washington during the Obama era. Well, there you go. So Something for everybody here. Well, thanks for taking the time, Alex. Really enjoyed it. Thank you, Bob. Take care. All right, you too. All right.